Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Doug uh, Henwood. I am a journalist, economic journalist, and um, member of the uh, uh, political, um, political education committee here and uh, involved in playing a night school and many other things. I first met Jane, oh, God, close to 20 years ago at the uh, Copkind Colony, an activist retreat up in southern Vermont, named after the late nation writer um, Andy Copkind. <coughs> Uh, ever since I've admired her discipline, rigor, focus, and seriousness, and she makes me feel like a bit of a slacker every time I talk to her and think of her. Um, she took an or unorthodox route into the union movement, uh, Central America env and environmental activism, didn't get involved in the labor movement until the mid-90s, uh, uh, which makes some mostly male union types uncomfortable, like she's an outsider or something. Uh, her first uh, task was working on a project in Stanford, Connecticut, uh, an unorthodox organizing project, uh, which went beyond the workplace uh, to what she called whole worker organizing, getting to people in their communities as well as their workplaces. Uh, she went to uh, do a healthcare, org or healthcare organizing at SEIU uh, for oh, about a decade, and then went to graduate school at CUNY, where she was advised by the great uh, Francis Fox Piven, started writing books, three of them, Raising Expectations and Raising Hell, uh, published by Verso uh, 2012, I think. No Shortcuts, published by Oxford uh, University Press 2016. And most recently, earlier this year, A Collective Bargain, uh, published by Echo. A tremendous organizer and thinker, and we're very honored to have her here and uh, very grateful to her for coping with PG&E's uh, incompetence at uh, delivering electric power to Northern California. Well, hello. Is that, the, is that the kickoff there, Doug? Yeah, go Jeremy, all right, cool. Um, thank you uh, to North Brooklyn DSA. Um, there's a couple of familiar faces in here already, which is nice. Um, and Doug, thank you for that warm uh, introduction. Um, I had warned Doug yesterday, I thought, although apparently that email didn't even get sent. Um, as our power was being powered down, uh, I warned Doug that I may not make it tonight uh, and then scrambled this morning trying to figure out who I knew who had power, who also would let me into their house, right, because of COVID stuff, um, so I could actually continue to do this uh, date with all of you tonight. So um, I figured that out. And as I said to Jeremy and a few others when I first logged in, the consequence of me scrambling around trying to figure out how to keep my date with North Brooklyn DSA in a huge power outage, um, is that I'm not fully prepared, although I just got a good idea of what I want to do. So, um, so that's by way of just saying uh, I, I'm sort of living in the moment in ways that we all are. Um, meaning, for people who don't know, I live half the time in New York City and half the time here, and actually it's like a third of New York City, a third here, and then like two thirds on the road or something like that, or the other third on the road. Um, but the time I am in California, I will say by way of intro to the day, uh, has been increasingly complicated by climate change in ways that are Sandy-like, but sort of reoccurring in California with the fires. Um, I have spent the last couple of months trying to figure out, you know, could we go outside today? Could we breathe air outside today? And now we have the flip side, which is, can we get power? Because um, Pacific Gas and Electric shut down our power uh, against our will yesterday, and we'll do so for several days, as they just do now, um, because they they're trying to avoid more fire, which, like, in the short term, that's a good thing, right? In the long term, we've had two years since the big fires in fall of 2018, and there hasn't been a lick of thinking about, like, what would the proactive thing do to be on the part of a capitalist uh, entity to actually make it so you didn't have to forcibly shut people's power off to avoid fire, right? They're not thinking that way, um, which is maybe a, an appropriate way to talk about class, power, race, ethnicity, sexism, uh, and everything else that, that we find ourselves deeply embroiled in when we do trade union work. So I'm delighted to be here. Um, and I think, I think what I wanna do is just run through a handful of um, PowerPoint slides, which Jeremy may, or someone has to give me some, some share screen with me, make me a co-host. But I think what I wanna do for folks on the call, if I could see you all, there's far too many to see you all, so I can't. But um, I don't have a sense of how many of you have seen me do uh, a basic conversation about how I think about organizing in power. But I think, 
just to be just to be clear through a political education class i'm going to run through some slides and go through what i consider to be the five core concepts and then i'm just going to get into a discussion so like take notes write your questions down i'll warn you in advance that i don't look at the chat while i present or speak um, though i'm happy to have anyone pull stuff out of the chat for me afterwards and feel free to write anything you want in the chat as we're going um, but I think if that I think that's what I'm going to do just to sort of keep focused as we slide into the the PowerPoint and what I think of as the five core concepts of how our side can win I should say that winning is um, a really important word to me I feel like part of what the left does is not win enough um, and I like to talk about winning because I actually think it matters to win um, it's not enough just to have like the valiant struggle. It's not enough just to have like perfect politics. It's not enough just like to debate out, you know, the perfect theory and the perfect line. My life experience, 20, oh my God, I'm getting old. Uh, Doug, I think you were off on that 20 years, by the way. But anyway, my, whatever it is, 30 years of direct organizing work and then five in the academy uh, has always said to me that one thing that matters a lot is winning. Like I have never seen people it, most often in my life, workers um, go through a, the same kind of profound transformation as they do when they actually win. Um, so I'm going to focus on winning as a concept. And the backdrop for tonight, of course, is that whether or not, I don't know, someone on here is going to know. I'm not looking because everything I had was drained from its power source today. I don't know if Amy Comey Barrett is now the sixth super extreme person on the court or if it, they're still voting or whatever, but like that's happening as we are doing this Zoom, right? They are making her um, the person. So meaning our courts are gone. I mean, I would say that when DSA had me first do a conversation with some DSAers nationally about a year and a half ago, I opened up a talk I did with the national DSA by saying the courts are gone. And that was before the latest um, appointment. So the backdrop to this, if we're thinking about winning and power, um, is that the courts are actually gone. Um, the Supreme Court uh, is incredibly right wing uh, and will be, you know, within minutes if they haven't yet gaveled her in, but they will by the end of the evening. Um, and even before Amy Comey Barrett and Trump getting three outrageous appointments to the U.S. Supreme Court, we were already in big trouble. Um, and again, this is by way of introduction to why I want to talk about organizing um, and the trade union movement. And when I think about power in the United States, and you think about the fact that we've lost the high court, for people who haven't had enough just time yet to think it through, we don't even understand what that means yet, because essentially there's a ton of cases that are in the pipeline that are heading towards the court, not just the Affordable Care Act in the next week, not just, oh, the presidency of the United States, right? And whether or not keeping recounts open is legitimate, because that's all going to be up in the next few weeks in the US Supreme Court. But even at a much more fundamental level, with a 6-3 balance on a right-wing court, their plan is to essentially do away with and choke all regulation. Like they want to just continue the work that Steve Bannon set out for them, which is essentially dismantling quote unquote, the administrative state, right? Steve Bannon's language. They actually want to destroy the capacity um, for corporations to be regulated. And that is why talking about the trade union movement is gonna be so important. So um, I'm gonna start a screen share. Just give me one sec, here we go. Um, and put that down so I can start the slideshow. Um, and I'm not going to run this whole thing. And again, I did not sit down and just, I mean, just like within five minutes of, of before starting with you, I just carved a few slides out. They're what I consider to be the core concepts of organizing. So Doug mentioned these books. That's two of them. There's an earlier one. Some of you might have read the opening chapter too about the Florida recount, which Jack had been reprinted uh, two weeks ago. Um, so I just want to dive into organizing, why it matters, and then have like a robust discussion because it'll be fun. To me, it's more fun to get into like Q&A with you. So I'm going to run a couple of concepts by you first. One, especially given what's going on at the court, for our side to win, for like the forces of good to win, I, my life experience, and I think our history tells us, that high participation is basically a prerequisite to power. Like for our side to win, we have to be able to understand how to build really high participation. Um, 
but we also need three other things. We need unity against division, uh, which is not uh, easy, as you probably know. Um, we need really tight, effective structure to our movement, like actually, how do you structure a movement? How do you create a mobilization structure? How do you know every block of North Brooklyn is covered by a DSA chapter, every building, every, sorry, block, every neighborhood, every building, every floor in a big tenement complex, right? I'm talking about like human structure, which I'll talk about what that looks like. Um, and then we need what we call demonstrable and sustainable majorities, meaning can we actually demonstrate that we've got majority and supermajority support for the work that we're doing. Um, why does this matter? One, because the 1% rule by dividing us, pure and simple, like just pure and simple, right? Pitting worker against worker, neighbor against uh, neighbor, country against country, neighbor against worker, worker against neighbor, public sector worker against private sector worker, so-called, so, you know, like division is the way that um, the right has always ruled and Trumpism, a very good exemplar, right, of the fact that the right rules by division. There's no uh, actual reason why um, the 1% should be ruling over any of us um, in the United States or anywhere else because we outnumber them substantially, uh, but they do it um, because they're good at dividing us and we're frankly not very good about how do you build the kind of solidarity and structure of power that can go up against them. Um, neoliberalism strategy, right, has been about cultivating individualism. Boy, this is an old slide, and I have to say that I feel like the whole mask debate and the, um, the lack of people wearing masks uh, is, is, a, is, a, is a good example, bad example, good example of the bad uh, success of neoliberalism's strategy of cultivating individualism. Um, right, it's like been a project for 45 years of sort of unmaking the working class. That's what's been happening. And which is why no matter how complicated trade unions are, how complex the politics of them are, um, I am sticking with the labor movement. Uh, I've been in it since I was 29, 29, 29. Doug said unconventional route into it. Sort of it was true, except that my family roots were in the trade union movement. So I was a great disappointment to my father. My mother is dead. I was a huge disappointment to my father when I didn't go straight to the trade union movement, which I found to be, uh, what do they say, old, stale, male, and a bunch of other things when I was young. And so I went looking elsewhere, which was Latin America work um, and the environmental movement, just saying that really quickly. And I very quickly came back to the trade union movement. And I came back to sort of the roots in the family because I could not find a route to power that was satisfactory to the goals I think that we have as a movement, except and unless I went back into trade unions where I think there is a serious amount of power to be had and made still. Um, obviously people are aware of West Virginia in 2018. I'm, I'm setting a backdrop with a few pictures to suggest um, that when I say demonstrable majority and supermajority support, this is what I mean. Demonstrable supermajorities. This was a 34,000 person out strike out of 34,000 people. I'm bad at math, that's 100% out. And that was across teachers and bus drivers and cafeteria workers, right, and all the service workers. So this is like good old school, 100% out, serious strike that was also illegal um, in West Virginia. We saw it happen in Arizona. Uh, we saw it happen in the Marriott fight on the private sector side in 2018. Um, in January of 2019, we saw it in Los Angeles in the streets of LA, 34,000 strong, purely teachers. Um, we saw it in Chicago in the fall of 2019, another 100% out, okay, 97 crossed. I think that's the number that the right-wing press finally calculated was that 97 workers out of 28,000 crossed in Chicago. Uh, I'll take that number, by the way, not bad at all. Um, so, so how Chicago and Los Angeles in particular, like what, what produced those pictures was not like someone putting out a Facebook post and saying, hey, it's time to strike. So I'm just going to slow down for a minute and explain that that's not how we got to any of those <laughs> huge strikes. Um, the way we got there is uh, essentially following five core concepts um, that I'm going to run you through fairly quickly so that we can just get into some dialogue. Um, the first of what I call the core, core concepts of organizing, distinct from mobilizing, distinct from advocacy, distinct from everything else, um, are these. The first is what I call structure versus self-selecting. And in no shortcuts, I write a lot about this, but I'm going to actually illustrate it for you today. 
So the first concept that I think matters when the way my brain works when I set out to win a, you know, um, help teach people how to win a very large campaign um, is that I operate in what I call a structure-based environment. Almost all union work, though not all, is in what we think of as a structure-based um, environment. And I want to show you what I mean by that. A structure um, is human agency, by the way. I mean, the structure of human beings. Like humans create a structure when I use the word structure. So a structure is a workplace, could be a church, mosque, temple, synagogue, could be a house, you know, big tenement project, um, big apartment complex like I live in in New York City, um, could be um, a neighborhood, uh, could be a public school. And I don't mean if you're a teacher, I mean if you're a parent engaging with parents when you drop your kid off when we have school again, um, if we get out of this pandemic or when we get out of it. Um, so a structure is, a, is essentially, we're gonna focus on a workplace one, but it applies across the board, definitely to tenant union building as well. But a structure, when I think of it, is a place, certainly in the workplace, where people come together, not because they like each other, uh, not because they agree with each other, not because they wanna make common cause with each other, but in the case of a workplace, because the boss hired them, because the pay was right or not, the hours were right or not, um, and they needed a job and a boss hired them. And then they come to work, and in the work I do, which is healthcare and education, so far, we're still in a shift-based kind of environment in the healthcare sector where most of my life is spent. Um, and so people begin to build relationships, and they're building those relationships not because they have any political affinity with themselves at all. So it's sort of like the opposite of the North Brooklyn DSA chapter, for example, where you come together because uh, you want change um, and because you agree on some basic core ideas about political change. Whether or not you're going to read details is a different thing, but you're coming together primarily because you're trying to build something called the DSA in North Brooklyn. That's really different than structure-based organizing where people come together for other reasons, and it's not because they agree. So self-selecting, which is more of what a North Brooklyn DSA is, a self-selecting organization, environmental organizations, women's organizations, Occupy Wall Street, like a lot of single issue fights um, are what we call, what I call self-selecting organizations. You come together because you agree on something that you want to fix or do. Uh, and there's nothing wrong with that, by the way, super important, but they're different. And understanding the difference in them and the limitations and possibilities is huge if we want to actually make a uh, big change. Um, and I'm going to argue that in structure-based organizing, we can methodically track and understand, are we building majority support in any given structure? And I'm talking about very large structures, right? Could be 34,000 teachers across 900 schools in Los Angeles, right? That's a structure of teachers that's being built. So we'll know whether or not we're building majorities when we do structure-based organizing. Have 50% um, um, of all the workers in 900 schools sign the same petition calling on the boss uh, to get the cops out of the schools? Have only 25% of all the teachers in 900 schools signed a petition calling on the boss to get rid of the cops in schools or whatever it is, right? Whatever the demand is, have 75%, right? We can track that. And that's part of the beauty of structure based organizing. We know what our numbers are, we know what our power is, and numbers equal power in ordinary people's organizations, right? The right wing has the media, the military, the might, the guns, you know, money, all that stuff. We got one thing which is each other. So that's concept one. Concept two is what I call leaders versus activists. Um, and by leader, I mean something called an informal leader. Uh, an organic leader is the word I use in my second book, actually in all three books, because that's how I was taught it, right? By people who trained me. Um, a leader in my definition has no position and no title. They simply are somebody who's well-respected by their coworkers. Um, and in a, in a structure-based union campaign or any other campaign I've run, Doug mentioned that the first one I ran uh, was unconventional. It was in part because as trade unions, we decided to build an adjacent tenant union movement in Connecticut um, at the time. And we built six huge tenant unions and six big public housing um, developments uh, and stopped every single one of them from being bulldozed um, in a huge gentrification plan. So, and the same rules applied in tenant organizing as they do in trade union organizing. So a leader is the person that when that person says, let's all go right now, everyone on their floor or in their building or in their unit says, okay, let's go. Or when they say, would you sign this petition or this union card? When they ask their coworkers, the person gets 90% of the people to sign that 
high-risk action. Um, and then an activist, again, this is not a bad thing, it's just different. An activist is someone who's just super committed to the cause. Um, so that's a really big difference. And what I think is, and I'm gonna illustrate leader versus activist in a minute, when I think about leaders, I think about people who have the capacity to get the work done at a different, faster, different kind of level than activists who are crucial to getting the work done. But again, understanding the difference is really important. And I'm gonna illustrate that one. So we call it Ideator, Ideator I, 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 understanding the difference between a leader and an activist, we have a method called identifying leaders, leader ID. Um, and I'm gonna run through that right now. So the method is organic leader ID, and one of our key weapons is what we call structure tests. So remember, structure versus self-selecting. So I'm gonna show you what a structure test is. How do you know your structure is getting strong? How do you know if you're building it strong? So structure versus self-selecting, then we've got leaders versus activists. Then we've got majorities versus minorities, by which I mean, are we building numerical majority support among whatever the base constituency is versus what I call the easy one third. By the way, in almost any workplace, you can get about 25% of the workers or 30% initially, you'll find that they're pissed off about something and ready to sign some kind of petition. The problem with most trade union work with inexperienced organizers or activists um, is that they don't realize when they're getting a bunch of people signed up in the beginning, it may not be the people that they need. And they never get through the 25 or 30% because there's always 25 or 30% in my experience who you will get signed up but getting to the harder to reach two thirds or three quarters is actually the work of organizing. Um, so building majority support, crucial concept. Okay, so I wanna illustrate this and I'm not gonna talk for much longer um, because leader ID and structure test to me are the foundational part of our work. So I wanna just walk people quickly through what these slides are. This is one campaign that I was running in 2016, one hospital. This is one unit in one hospital in Philadelphia. Registered nurses is the bargaining unit, meaning the group of workers who are trying to form a union. Thousand of them in this hospital. There were seven other hospitals in the campaign, but this is just to illustrate the concept. This is the surgical intensive care unit, what I call SICU, what, work, what nurses call SICU, the surgical intensive care unit. And what you see on this chart is uh, basically everything and nothing, sort of. So you see all the names of the workers who work in that one department, Surgical Intensive Care Unit. That's the name of every single worker in there. On the top of it, you see AM, on the bottom you see PM. So it's the entire unit, it's the day shift and the night shift. There's two 12-hour shifts um, in this hospital and foremost nurses at this point in America. Um, and Every single one of those dots, lines, arrows, and everything, except the black line. The black line is just taking out their, their last name um, for teaching purposes. But every single dot on there and line and color is a structure test. And I'm gonna show you a couple of structure tests before I stop speaking. So um, the blue dot next to their name means they signed uh, an authorization card to hold a union vote. The, Green dot, and it says it's at the bottom if you look at it. The green dot says that they're signing a vote yes, that, that they signed their name to petition saying, I'm gonna vote yes for the union. That second one, that green dot, is a public petition, which is much more high risk, way more high risk. First one was a private act, boss wouldn't see it. By the second petition, we're escalating the risk factor in our work. So now their boss is gonna know that they signed um, a petition saying I'm gonna vote for the union. That's a big gap between a private authorization and a publicly your name is going to your boss. The red dot is they signed a public negotiations petition. Yellow dot is a survey. So each one of these means something. The last important one I'm gonna tell you is when the yellow highlighter is over their name, now we're on to the next level of the campaign. This is for people who have never seen it. This represents about five months of the campaign. So many structure tests we're doing. It's about five months of the campaign in this hospital. Um, workers don't yet have a first contract, but the yellow highlight over their name means we've moved them to the next stage, which is they've signed um, a union membership card to have their dues um, deducted. So just to give you a sense of it, now take a look at the next unit. This is labor and delivery, same hospital, same day, same meeting. And if you're looking carefully, you're gonna notice that this is not nearly as together as SICU. In SICU, almost every single worker is participating in almost every single structure test. 
activism, like every decision the workers are making about the next step in the campaign, almost everyone is participating. Get to labor and delivery, and if you stare at those dots and lines, you're gonna see a lot less structure and a lot less evenness, because not everybody is actually engaged. Um, and what the difference is between the two is that in this unit, we have the two organic leaders, right? No position, they hold no position, they don't call themselves a leader, they just are the informal leaders. We know who they are. We've identified them. They've accepted their role in the campaign and they are driving a very hard union campaign against some of the top union busters in the country. So some of the very top union busters, the ones that Google has now hired, um, IRI Inc, who came in and fired some Google workers, uh, is who we were fighting in this, in this campaign. So in this campaign, you can see the middle column. If you look next to Patrick's name, three up from the bottom, there's a black dot next to his name. That's because he's the identified organic leader, identified by his coworkers. No professional staff, no organizer could ever figure out who a leader is. Only the workers themselves can say who the leader is. Same with the night shift. We've got Kathy Benor with a little black dot next to her name. Okay, that's surgical intensive care. Now you get the idea, you see labor and delivery. It's a mess in labor and delivery, it's messy. That unit's not in great shape at this point in the campaign. In fact, we had the two leaders, but they hadn't yet accepted their role to really drive the campaign and to try and win the union, though they would go on to do that. Now, I can't see you all, but I hope you're looking. Because the question is, what's going on in this unit? Same hospital, same day in a meeting, same fight. So if I could see all of you, 72 of you, which I can't, uh, if we were face to face, like the old days, I would be saying to you, like, by show of hand, you know, what do you think is going on here? Um, and what most people say is uh, we haven't identified the correct organic leaders. Um, and what I am here to explain to you is the concept of organic leader, again, from the SICU to this unit. This is telemetry, very big unit, 66 workers. Um, we have identified the organic leader and she is running the anti-union campaign. So there is a leader and she's running the campaign against her coworkers. She's been captured by IRI Inc. I tell this story actually in the brand new book, An Eclectic Bargain, I tell this story at great length. And her name is not blacked out in here because I wrote a chapter about her and she's okay with that. It's Marnay Payne in the middle column on the top in the day shift. She was the leader in her unit and she had that unit on lockdown and no one was doing anything in the union campaign because coworkers would turn to Marnay and say, hey, Marnay, you down with this union idea yet? And she'd say, hell no, I don't trust unions. They lie, they cheat, they steal, and everything the union busters told her at that point in the campaign. Um, and I wanna contrast her with Liz Miller on the bottom of the chart on the left-hand side, the only worker that's got three dots next to her name. Liz was the union activist. So Liz is an activist. Liz came to every pro-union meeting. Liz took assignments every week at union meetings, how to build the union, to get her coworkers to sign up on every single one of the structure tests, and she could never do it because she loved the union. She was working really hard, but she did not have the respect of her coworkers in a high-risk, high-intensity campaign. And by the way, if we fast forward to next week, we're all gonna be probably in a high-risk, high-intensity campaign. So where this matters is when people are fearful and scared, uh, which is almost always the case with big union busters, you will actually um, lose if you can't first identify who are these informal leaders who have the respect of their coworkers and who can then carry them through high risk, scary moments. In the case of the US, when the boss says, we're gonna fire you. You put that union button on, we're gonna fire you. If you're asking me if that's legal, of course it's not legal. Does it happen in every campaign I've ever worked in? Every campaign. So that's telemetry, and that's a big problem. You got too many charts that look like that, and you're toast. You're not gonna win, and the workers will lose. There will be no union, there'll be no negotiations, and there'll be no change in their lives. That's the same unit. And this is the same unit that I just showed you. Telemetry, telemetry, Tower 5. There's Marnay Payne's name. The day that Marnay Payne decided that she had been on the wrong side and she was gonna become pro-union, she signed up every single person who you see in yellow in two hours. So that's what an organic leader can do. And the, the method and sort of the science and the art and science of building a working class movement has a lot to do with both figuring out who the Marnay Paynes are, 
and then figuring out how to win them over through really hard conversations. So that's the concept of leader versus activist with Liz versus Marnay illustrating it. These are workers, I'm about to wrap up now. These are workers working on their wall charts, just so you get it. This is not some weird top-down secret poo system. This is a radically transparent bottom-up approach to how do you build a trade union. Workers do all the work. Um, Full-time quote-unquote staff are never allowed in a private sector facility in this country. So all of this is about, can we teach the workers how to build their union? My life work is about, can I teach the workers how to build their own union and build a really tight, effective workplace structure, which is what they're doing in that picture. Um, and then just to close in terms of speaking about it, there, these are what structure tests look like. This is 5,000 out of 8,000 um, names on a gigantic, uh, like seven feet by eight foot, whatever it was, poster, hand signed. Um, and we do a lot of hand signed and we're even doing hand signed in COVID because we tell people to take a picture and text it while they're talking to us, right? So all, everything I'm talking to you about can be done under COVID rules. And we are already doing it. Uh, we are doing it right now in a campaign I'm working on in California. So um, the key is individual action, individual participation to get to a supermajority on a structure test. This is a different hospital campaign. That's like 700 roughly out of um, 900 signatures. Bunch of nurses about to march on the boss. We call it a march on the boss. Once you have a supermajority, I mentioned demonstrable supermajorities in the beginning of this, you march that on your employer and you let the employer know that you're about to kick their ass. Then the best way to do that is to show it, not tell it, show it, right? Here's all the signatures, we're coming for you. Um, this is the first structure test that the nurses I just showed you um, in Philadelphia succeeded at. It's actually two pages long of those signatures. Uh, and that's a bunch of the nurses getting ready to do a march on the boss in Philadelphia in 2016 to show the employer that we're a, like, there's, it, was, it was curling up on the bottom. It was so big. We're a super majority and we're coming for you. Um, they were on a break, 15 minute break time, about to run that to the CEO. And then like 18 security guards came about a minute later. But anyway. Um, we then escalate to photo petitions, majority photo posters, because they're even scarier, right? If you think putting your signature is scary uh, in a campaign where someone says, we're going to fire you, putting your face um, on it is even scarier. So this is a photo poster that was six feet long. Um, and more recently, as I round up here, um, this is a majority photo poster from Germany. I've been working in Germany a lot um, in the last year and a half since some of my books were translated into German. Um, and this is a thousand nurses out of 1100 nurses. That's a super, super majority photo po poster. I don't know what it says. If someone reads German, feel free. But, um, but this is with Verdi. Uh, it's a union in Germany. It's with nurses. So this stuff is working all across um, the world. I love this picture. So I'm going to probably end on it for the sake of getting into discussion. That's the <laughs> ultimate structure test in Chicago in 2012. That's Karen Lewis in the middle at the strike vote of the Chicago teachers in 2012. And for them to know that they were ready to fill the largest opera house in downtown Chicago, and you can tell there's a bunch of politicians lining her on the stage, they had to know that they could fill the largest opera hall in downtown Chicago, um, and that they could fill it more than once in order to know that they were gonna meet a 75% turnout mandate that Rahm Emanuel passed a special law that said the strike vote wouldn't be valid unless 75% of the teachers partook in it. Imagine if that was true for our democracy. Just thinking about next week, right? Like if the 3rd of November, we said no election in the United States is valid unless 75% of Americans eligible to vote voted, like who do you think would win? Okay, I digress. But that was the law imposed on the Chicago teachers back in 2011. Um, and so by the time they got to the 2012 strike, they were doing multiple versions of the wall charts and the structure tests that I just walked you through. And so were the LA teachers. I mean, every one of these huge strikes um, has resulted from uh, structure tests. All right, last one I'll show you. Um, and then I'm gonna, I'm gonna get rid of the slides. Um, I, personally ex I personally practiced something I was taught when I was young as a negotiator, which is, um, I believe in what's called open big negotiations. Um, whenever I'm in union negotiations, helping workers win a great contract, um, they look kind of like this, if not larger. I believe in bringing every single worker possible into the negotiations room um, to negotiate 
for themselves, essentially, with coaching from me. Because my view of my role as an organizer and a negotiator is to coach and teach and train people what it takes to win. Because uh, I'm never going to stay there. I'm like an itinerant organizer. I'm going to move on, right? So my life work is having simple systems like wall charts and simple methods like structure tests to teach ordinary workers how to beat their boss and then how uh, to defeat um, evildoers. So I can probably show more, but I think I'm going to stop because I'd rather be able to engage in some um, Q&A with folks, if that makes sense. So that's, um, that's the opening salvo to what's going to have to happen in this country when the Supreme Court is lock, stock, and gone. Um, and that's how we get to big strikes. And for all the chatter about general strikes, we don't get to general strikes without a lot of strikes. And the basics of what I just showed you is a very old methodology using very, very low-tech tools. Magic markers, dots, crayons, and highlighters, and hand signatures, wheat pasting it at a Kinko's late at night onto a giant poster board. So when I think about organizing, it's super uh, low tech and super high impact. And really almost anyone can do this, um, but experience helps. And we're not gonna get back control of this country until we get a hell of a lot more strikes. Um, and that's the foundational tools for how we've gotten to every strike that I've had the pleasure um, of either being part of and or leading. So then we just stop there. And then uh, we should, you, whatever your method is, North uh, Brooklyn DSA, we should just do some Q&A, if that makes sense. Yes, thank you so much, Jane. Um, I'm gonna take it over with some uh, community agreements before we kick off the Q&A. Um, you guys can feel free to uh, just type stack into the chat if you have a question, um, and we will moderate that and, and call on you however you prefer, Jane. We can do like a few questions at a time or, or one by one. Um, yeah. Do three at a time or something. Okay, sounds good. Um, so we'll do that and then, yeah, just uh, try to be brief with your questions so we can be mindful of time. Um, yeah, we went over stack and, you know, always assume good intentions. We're all here to learn. So just being comradely as a uh, community agreement as well. So go ahead. Um, I think Carrington, are you moderating the, moderating the stack uh, chat? Uh, yes, I'll be monitoring okay, this. Cool. The stack. Um, thank you so much, Jane. That was wonderful. Okay, so uh, Doug would like to kick it off with the, the first question. Go ahead, Doug. You have um, to unmute sorry. yourself. I had to unmute myself um, uncharacteristically. Um, that was marvelous, Jane. Thank you very much. Um, I'm sure you're familiar with the uh, critique coming out of the labor notes end of the spectrum that you rely too much on professional organizers and your identification of organic leaders is still kind of a top-down thing. And you underplay the importance of um, the organic leaders organizing from the ground up. What, what do you say to that critique? I'm taking two more or going right at that? My favorite topic, no, I'm kidding, but I'll take two more, right? Is that right or no? Um, you can just take dogs and then we'll, we'll accumulate questions. Okay, sure. Um, yeah, uh, <laughs> I think the juxtaposition of this, if we were being honest, um, Doug, would be uh, that the alternative is that sort of like sec uh, <laughs> sectarian organizers in the rank and file are supreme versus professionals, right? It's sort of this interesting debate that goes on in the American left. It really frustrates me. Um, I would say a couple of things. The first is this. Every organizing campaign that I have been involved in is essentially run uh, by rank and file workers. It has to be, right? Because of what I was mentioning earlier, which is there's no campaign I've ever run where I was ever allowed inside, to like, to even to like touch my toe inside the door because we'll be arrested, by the way. Like that's actually what happens in union campaigns in America, right? Um, so if, if the quote unquote outside organizer attempted to like walk into a hospital, um, and I can tell you I've attempted to, I've attempted to sneak into them before. Um, when I was in Las Vegas organizing, it was to the point where I walked into a hospital with my then boyfriend, um, just to give you a sense of how crazy this is. I walked into a hospital to take the guy I was living with then to a procedure. And before we walked, and it was like 5.30 in the morning, right? 
Uh, it's dark and I'm like walking my nervous boyfriend in for a day surgery. Um, and when I was about 10 feet from the door, security guards came out and put their arms up and said, you're not going in those doors. And I was like, you know, I was completely flabbergasted. It was a non-union hospital so far at that point, so far. You better believe we went back after those mofos. But anyway, I was like, sorry, I'm here with this guy and he has a procedure at six o'clock in the morning and I'm just walking him in. Um, anyway, this is how crazy it is. So um, I say that to say, the work of good organizing is to teach people how to win. Now, who's the organic leader? And I don't even understand what the thing is about how this becomes framed as top down, though I find it um, deeply amusing after you know 25 years of trade union campaigns. The organic leaders, um, I mean, in some theory of like, you get into debate about like the rank and file strategy, right? There's a lot of debate about that. Um, and we could, we could get into it more, but um, for me, it winds up being this very complicated idea where we're suggesting that if s smart people who are leftists take a position in a facility, but hide who they are, um, and then either like think they're becoming the organic leader uh, in a campaign um, or do the work of playing an organizer like I do and trying to help identify who are those correct people, like who are the natural leaders among the workers, um, then it's not really any different than like if you have someone like me who's run tw campaigns for 25 years, workers call, they want to form a union, and like we call a meeting at the local church or the local pub in the basement and we say, look, Here's, here's what's gonna happen to you when the union buster is hired. And if you don't do the following things in the following order, you're gonna lose, right? Now I could, say, I could, I could take a job um, and go into the rank and file, I, mean, I couldn't anymore, it's not possible, I don't think given my profile, given that union busters seem to have photos up, but like I could either go in the rank and file, which would be fine, and play an organizer role, but I'm not sure that's any different. The point about doing that is, to know how to win in the kind of campaigns that happen in most US workplaces right now means you better have some skill and you better have some experience and you better have someone coaching you on what's gonna happen when the union buster shows up and starts firing people or they get the Marnay pains, right? Because the union busters, by the way, know who the organic leaders are and what they're doing is training the managers to identify them. So I always, I always think it's very funny because I say the only one who doesn't know who the organic leader is in the workplace by shift um, is our side. Um, because who generally knows who they are are the managers and the professional union busters. Because it's not, because there's a method to it. It's like, who, who's that worker who workers turn to? So from my view, it's kind of the opposite um, of top down versus bottom up. Like, I meet a group of workers and I say, here's the work you have to do and you have to do it. I can't do any of it. I'm not having the conversations. I can't go into the workplace. I'm functionally a teacher to a group of workers that hopefully is a growing group of workers and I'm coaching them on how to win and what it's gonna to take to win. So I don't, I never understand the debate on the left about this. Like if you get, if you're, if you, if you were Walter Ruther or any number of people from the 1930s, like we know, that all the people who went into the rank and file were getting very serious training, right? They had training methods. Um, there were whole schools of organizing in the 1930s. And the difference in the approach was leftists were getting training and taking jobs. Today, some of you, I hope, are still doing that because you should be. But it isn't like we need one versus the other. It's my read of this country at this point is we need every goddamn thing that works happening as fast as it can. And fundamentally, whether you take a position inside the workplace or you are in a position structurally outside the workplace, which is most of my life work, um, the goal is, the objective is, are you teaching the workers themselves how to do the work and how to win? And that's what those wall charts are that I showed you. Um, when I first went back into the campaign in 2016, just I'll close this, this example of, to your question, but when I went back into the workplace in 2016 to help run what became the largest organizing camp, successful campaign in America, which was Philadelphia in 2016, um, and I walked into 18, a room of 18 professional organizers, quote unquote, in the lingo, um, and I asked people where the wall charts were and they didn't have any. 
And actually the young organizers at the time said to me, you know, we have databases now, which I thought was like a very funny thing. You know, I was like, no, I'm not that old, you guys. You know, I've worked a database before. But databases don't teach workers how to form a union. A simple wall chart with colored markers actually will teach workers who are the workers they have to get and how they're gonna win. So, um, and I think that the organic, closing on, the, closing on this, the organic leader is recognition that in fact there are geniuses all over the workplace. That's the point of it. And there's more than one organic leader in a big facility. There's a lot of organic leaders, but there's also a lot of activists like Liz Miller, who I showed you on that wall chart, who was super into the campaign and couldn't move a coworker to do anything. So um, I don't, you know, I mean, I don't even understand how the theory has emerged that structure tests or organic leader identification uh, is top down. I think it's actually quite the opposite. I think it's fundamentally uh, radical and bottom up. Um, and so are the organizing methods that I learned that are from the 1930s. So um, they probably won't all be that long in my answer, but I think that's a pretty important one um, in the scheme of the work we do. Meaning if any of you go into the rank and file, you just, you've got to learn the same skill set as an organizer, um, and then you've got to deploy it. Uh, for me, I'd rather just say, hey, I'm a leftist organizer and I'm here to help you win. Um, I'm not making any secrets about it. I'm not bullshitting anyone. I'm in a big meeting with a bunch of people and I'm like, here's the work you have to do if you want to win. Uh, and I'm going to be gone in about six months. So you got to get really good at it. Right. Like to me, that's I don't, I don't I don't understand the some sectarian interpretation of that. But I think it's old left sectarian baggage personally. Thank you, Jane, for that answer. Um, Doug, are you satisfied? Do you have a follow-up question? Or are you good? No, I just felt like I had to act as devil's advocate. I'm totally on Jane's side of this one. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so on stack we have Jeremy, followed by Ryan, and then Mia. And I and we're gonna collect a, your, your several questions and Jane will respond as she desires. Um, hi, Jane. Thank you so much. Um, as, as ever, uh, excellent. Uh, really helpful. I had um, two questions. One was to hear your thoughts about uh, sort of near the beginning of the pandemic. There were a lot of, I mean, in some ways, I think I was struck with how like suddenly the whole world became like proper Marxists and we're like, oh, right, there are essential workers. And then there are like bougie people who aren't really doing very much and like could disappear and society could go on. And these essential workers are like absolutely fundamental and have like a lot of power. And, you know, it was amazing. And there was, I think, a, a great deal of sort of wildcat stuff and just, you know, obviously immense dissatisfaction with how the people most important to the economy were being uh, treated as sort of cannon fodder. Um, I wonder if, you think that that kind of moment and the organizing that was starting then, if that is going to pop up again, it seems to have kind of quieted down for a while, like kind of what you think about that. And then my second question was, um, you know, structure versus self-selecting organizations. And as you point out, DSA is a self-selecting organization, uh, ideological organization, et cetera. So what is the relationship between groups of these kinds or between strategies of these kinds? Like, um, why is it, is it important to be in a self-selecting organization like this one? And how does this one like use its resources, use its manpower to, um, to do structure-based organizing? Um, thank you, Ryan. Yeah. Um, hi, thank you so much for coming to speak with us. Um, and I think a part of what I want to ask is basing off of what Jeremy was just asking. But even before I get there, I feel like I have to uh, say that I am a uh, labor notes reader who also like completely supports the strategy and thinks that what you're saying is absolutely in line with my understanding of the rank and file strategy. Um, and I'm a, a teacher and a, a UFT member. Um, and in fact, before I was a UFT member, I was an organizer at CWA where um, I've been able to use a lot of the skills that I was trained uh, with uh, directly at being, you know, a, a building delegate and uh, an organizer within my union. Um, and so, yeah, I, I, it really clicks with me and the idea of us seeing ourselves as activists and organizer, organizers, whether as uh, staff or rank and file leaders is, is 100%. Um, I also learned today that Bernie Sanders is also a, a labor notes reader and subscriber, which is fascinating. <laughs> um, 
I think to build off of what Jeremy was asking, my particular question, and, and I have some ideas, but I'd love to hear what you have to say is, how does DSA help build the trade union movement? Um, what are the roles, and I, I do think it's multiple, I don't think there's necessarily one way, that um, we as a Democratic Socialist member organization all across the country can build uh, the trade union movement, um, both in terms of like, quantity and quality um, and then you know with the eye towards how do we merge or, or bring together movements uh, around uh, worker power as well as for our vision of democratic socialism good mia yeah um thanks i was kind of wondering a little bit about how these concepts that you detailed transfer over to other contexts outside of labor so like um, for example, as a campaign worker, like wondering, um, also in a place where like, yeah, in New York, electoral work has had a lot of buzz too. Um, yeah, how, how we see these concepts reflected in electoral work, because um, I know there are also different models within that type of work where, for example, you know, you can invest heavily in staff who identify volunteer leaders who then, you know, go on to lead operations or, you know, there are models where there are much fewer staff and it's kind of more heavily dependent on volunteers themselves. Um, so I'm wondering, yeah, what you see in those models and if it's not like, if it doesn't reflect that, what should we be doing differently um, in the campaign world to kind of, if it is effective to, to echo that structure? Great. Lots of overlap, uh, related overlap, I think, between them, which is helpful and, and good. Um, and all questions would be good anyway, so because that's the thing I like to do is chat. Um, so let's see. Um, I'm going to go, I'm going to weave in and out, but I've written all three of those, those questions down and some thoughts next to them. So I think just going back to, just, just for starters, going backwards to Jeremy for a minute on the question of um, essential workers. I couldn't agree more that the pandemic has ripped open the concept of who the hell matters to keep society functioning, right, versus who we could cast off in a boat on their yachts, like, cut them loose, take your yachts and go. Or uh, give them to us, actually, would be good, but anyway. So, um, but I, I, I want to raise one thing. Uh, Jeremy said we could see how much power they had. And I guess that's where I want to argue that actually, we, I think part of why it quieted down is because we didn't see how much power they had. I think we saw the potential, right, for their power. Um, every Amazon worker is only potential power until we figure out how to actually beat them and actually build structure-based power, right, and have a theory of power, for example, um, in the logistics sector. Um, same would be true for grocery store workers. Same would be true for the delivery drivers. Um, and... Just to give an example, very quickly in Los Angeles, when, when the pandemic was setting in, and I was engaging with a couple of United Food and Commercial Worker, really good, a really good local that's in Los Angeles, a great local actually right now, um, meaning bottom up, small democratic, you know, things we want. Um, uh, and they were scrambling um, to figure out how to, how to institute shop floor power early on in the pandemic when it was, you know, the height, the beginning, what we thought of as the beginning of the height of the crisis. Um, and they, because they already had a trade union, they very quickly began to say, they're gonna make demands that non-union sector workers couldn't do as easily, which was, um, if a case breaks out here and we find out about it, we're gonna, we're gonna shut every facility down, we're gonna demand their shutdown for four, every grocery store, shut down for 14 days, cleaned, sanitized, we come back with PPE, right? So you can see the difference in essential workers who had already dealt with building collective organization versus essential workers who hadn't and who we all are desperate to build that kind of collective action and collective power. But I think that, um, I think that in fact, the problem is that a lot of the essential workforce is yet unorganized, which is part of why I think the EWOC is a very exciting development, right? I think the, the attempt that's definitely got GSA's fingerprints all over it, um, along with the UE, to build the Essential Worker Organizing Committee and begin to help develop and train and skill up people who are in key positions and key sectors um, matters a lot. So that's a segue to like, what should DSA be doing? EWOC is a good example, in my opinion. Um, and I know that when I just was teaching the 
4,000 person strike school, we had a whole contingent from um, from the essential workers organizing committee in the in the in the course, and that was terrific. Um, just to know that they were in the course, learning these basics like how do you do leader identification? It isn't just that you put up a wall chart and do a structure test. There's a lot more to it, right? So we were actually teaching those skills um, during strike skill uh, strike school. Um, so I think a great thing for self-selecting organizations. There's at least there's at least two or three key roles. For, a, for the straw DSA and or what I call self-selecting organizations. In the context of me looking at where do self-selecting organizations fit into the structure-based side of the work, the side that I'm in. For starters, that's not little, it's big, right? Like actually creating so tension. Just the the very last thing you said, I think, froze out, at least for me. I don't know if that was for others, too. It did. And right when you said that, it said my internet was unstable. Well, this is the best I'm going to do on the internet front. But anyway, so the very most important thing is to hold the trade union movement accountable to broader left just goals. Like, that's hugely important. We know that doing structure based organizing, if we do it correctly, can actually build like thresholds of power that we're measuring that are more profound, I'm gonna argue, than self-selecting. But so who's gonna keep the trade union movement honest and accountable to its base? Hopefully, first of all, rank and file workers, right? If they're skilled up and trained and they've learned themselves how to do structure tests and they've learned themselves you know, how to keep their own wall charts. Um, every campaign I leave, every worker knows how to do that work, right? That's the goal of it. Um, so that the, we know that trade unions, though, as they amass more and more power, can tend to get a little bit disconnected from the base. So there are two ways to try and hold it accountable. One is uh, that I hope every single trade unionist who's a rank and filer, which is why I've written three books about it and do free strike schools with Rosa Luxemburg, um, I hope that they learn every skill that we talk about to how to run a hard organizing campaign. And DSA people should be teaching this, right? Learning it and teaching it. You should be organizers. Self-selecting people can be organizers, right? You've got to learn the skill and then be able to teach it to others and then so that they, we just keep teaching the skill of what it takes to win. So it's literally holding the trade union movement's feet to the fire like Black Lives Matter, right? Changing the entire discussion right now inside trade unions and out about what the priorities are. The environmental movement, the climate justice movement, helping hold larger trade unions feet to the fire about green jobs and a green new deal. So building enough momentum as a self-selecting organization to challenge the power holding institutions is a fundamentally important role. That's one. Two, and then like pushing the moral equation, like what should be the agenda of the trade union movement should definitely come from rank and file workers, but it should also be responding to the pressure of those workers when they punch the clock and go home to a Black Lives Matter march or go home to a women's march or go home to a, you know, Green New Deal or immigrant campaign or defund the police campaign, like whatever it is that worker self-expression is when they punch the clock and leave work and go home, those politics should be dragged right back into the trade union movement. Um, three, where would the average rank and filer in this country learn how to build power inside the workplace? Like where? Like where are they gonna learn it? That's like, a, that's like an open question. Um, they should be able to come to DSA to learn what the skill set is to do it, which means you've got to get really good at some of the basic, some of you already are, for sure, but like as a whole, like learning the skill set of what it takes to have a successful six step conversation. If people haven't ever seen a version of me doing it, it's in Jacobin from the Thanksgiving issue last year where I was coaching people on how to essentially um, convince your family to, you know, support Bernie and not the rest of the losers, uh, one of whom we're trying to drag across the finish line right now. Um, but so I, I outline a six step conversation in Jacobin. Like to me, it's a fairly straightforward thing. That's because I've been doing it for 25 years. There's a method. There's a method to every single skill that we need to win. And they're not rocket science, but they are skills. So the job of DSA and the self-selecting, you know, organizations and the progressive movement and the left needs to be to take the skills seriously, learn them and teach them and expand the trading movement that way. Take jobs inside the sectors, become professional organizers. I, th that word is so weird to me, like just take organizing seriously and realize it's a skill set. Um, and it's not like we wake up in the morning and put up a flip chart and say, let's have a strike today. Just 
total bullshit. Anyone who says that's how strikes happen in this country is smoking crack and has never run one, having run many of them. So, um, so and in the new book, by the way, I go through every structure test the LA teachers did methodically um, to get ready for the huge strike that they had. So that is the role of self-selecting, and in this case, ideological organizations. Teaching politics, teaching economics 101, but in addition to that, I think it's gotta be teaching how do you have a hard conversation and when. Um, and single issue work can really matter, right? To hold the rest of us accountable to our work. And then I think as it relates to rounding now, I sort of went through Ryan's, I think a little bit, and now I'm going into uh, Mia. I think um, in my, you know, I've run political campaigns. I May mean, I also run political campaigns um, and I've built tenant unions. And I'm, I've always used the same core approach to the work. So if I'm running a political campaign or building a tenant union and not just a trade union, trade union, um, if I meet a volunteer, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to assess and test that volunteer by giving them an assignment that's going to let me know how much capacity that person has. So if I say, can you bring, this may be an unreasonable number, so don't quote me on the number, but let's just say, I get someone who comes in, she's super excited about the work and the campaign and the, that we're running, uh, the political candidate that we're running. And I say, I'm, it's great, we go over the basics, we give her an assignment, right? Because you never have a volunteer without giving them an assignment. And you say, like, can you come back to the meeting next week with 20 people? And if she comes back with 20, she's got some serious capacity to get more people involved in the work, right? That's a, that's a first step towards an, an identification of organic leader. Um, and maybe we test her a different way. We may say, um, you know, what precinct do you live in or what the sub, you know, give her a, a two block assignment within her precinct and say, you know, can you go get um, 300 signatures for Bernie Sanders um, in your precinct in these two block quadrant that we built together. And we'll make that with her, right? Like what's a reasonable universe that you want to go out and work on the next week or something. Um, phone banking, like for me, what separates pure activism from organizing is, are we being methodical and are we spending our time talking to people who don't agree with us yet? Which is why I'm going to want to send that volunteer if she's really engaged and seems really good I'm going to send her out to go talk to some people who are not already obviously supporting Bernie or not already supporting whatever the candidate is and see how she does. And if she comes back and she's got, you know, 300, I'm going to, I'm going to, you know, commit to vote for Bernie Sanders. Um, that's someone who's got serious capacity. If she goes out and comes back and says, wow, that was super frustrating. I knocked on 300 doors. Um, it didn't go so well. Then our job in the self-selecting organization is to help that person get better. It's to help understand, well, let's get into a discussion. What'd you do when you knocked on the door, right? What was the conversation you had? What did you ask the person when they answered the door and when we were knocking on doors? So we'll be knocking on them again still. Um, you know, but it's like, I think it's our job is to help identify, in the case of volunteers in the campaign, bring them in, assess them in the same way that I'm gonna assess every single volunteer in a trade union campaign, figure out what they're good at, put them on what they're good at and develop them even more along the way if I can, right? But fundamentally understanding what roles people play in our campaigns um, is really crucial to, to knowing whether or not, whether or not and how we're going to win the campaign. Because each of us has different skill sets, each of us has different capacities, each of us um, frankly are different and we have strengths and weaknesses. And understanding how to win a really complicated, hard-fought campaign is partly about explaining that, being transparent about it, not making anyone feel bad about it. That's exactly what I do in every one of those trade union campaigns with one of those wall charts. Like people always say to me, doesn't it insult everybody, Jane, when you get the little black dots up next to their name? And I say, no, because I didn't make that decision. The workers on her shifted, right? It's the workers who, in the case of a trade union campaign, identify who their leader is, not me. Um, I'm just tallying it up right as they're going. So, um, so to me, that's it's. I think I think it's fair. And then and then even if you're going to do online, offline, the whole debate about online work um, uh, and distributed organizing, it's still following a similar logic, right? It's like figuring out who's actually getting the work done, and then our job is to understand why are they getting the work done. I'll give one more example, and I'll stop talking. Um, it's, it's very often the case, but the first time I realized that it was like, whenever you learn to me the first time, right, it's sort of shocking. Like I was in a campaign 
And I was misunderstanding who the organic leader was because I wasn't thoroughly debriefing the volunteer member, well, not yet member, but who was coming back in during big meetings because she'd walk in with like 25 union membership cards, 30 union membership cards in a big unit. And I'd be like, whoa, amazing. And then she'd go put her dots up on the wall chart, you know. And fast forward, it was finally like one day, I said, we were having a conversation with her. And one day she said something like, oh yeah, no, I just come to the meetings. I didn't collect any of these. You know, George collected all of them and gave them to me, right? That's like, you have to learn to ask the questions of like, oh, if someone brings in 30 cards, you got to say, wow, how'd you do that? Tell me how you did that. How'd you, how'd you get those 30 cards in a high intensity campaign or 300 signatures for Bernie in a political precinct if you've given them a two block assignment? So to me, everything is about stru creating structure where it doesn't exist, like in a political precinct. Let's decide on three blocks together. And you're going to go knock on doors to people who are independents and not already pro Bernie workers and see if you can move a conversation with them. And I'm going to try and give that person some pointers and some training and work through with them how to have an effective conversation right before they go out and get an assignment like that. And I'm going to help assess how they did um, by asking them a bunch of questions when they come in successful or not. And then I'm going to try and give them a different kind of assignment and see if they can pull that off. Because our job is to make individuals feel good about themselves and win. And it's to make whole groups of people feel confident in themselves, like the working class, and win. Because losing doesn't help us. Uh, thank you so much. So next on stack, we have Bran, then Arsha, then me. Uh, Bran? Hi, Jane. Thank you so much for coming. I really love No Shortcuts, um, and I really appreciated uh, your wonderful presentation. Um, I'm a member of UAW 2865 and a steward in my department at UCLA. Um, and um, I, those charts really, um, I don't know, I've, I've been looking at so many spreadsheets lately <laughs> um, in organizing. And um, anyway, I'm a huge fan of these analog met methods. Obviously, we're now organizing in a pandemic and I know in, in, the, in my, the case of my uh, workplace, every, everyone is spread out, right? Um, there's no one physically anymore there. Um, now I'm wondering how organizers can actually take advantage of this total change in workplace and, and working environment um, and how to or, and, uh, organize when um, you know, we're, everything is virtual and there are no commons anymore. Um, and, then the, and then similarly, how are union busters shifting gears during this pandemic? What, what are union busters doing in response to COVID? Um, thank you. Thank you. Um, and Arsha. Hi, Jane. I said, I, I said, I thank you for the training that you had and for, for us architects. Uh, by the way, my name is Arsha, he, him. I've been sending people to the training for, for uh, Jane because I think she's tremendous. And I think that, um, you know, whatever you have done so far in terms of architects, uh, it's been remarkable. Uh, so that's what I wanted to start with. Thank um, you. And yeah, and, and so the way, way um, we wanted to organize architects, bunch of us that were more radical and DSA members and, you know, communist members, whatever, architects decided to, uh, in a convention to unionize architects. So like we, we targeted this many firms and then found these two firms that are in New York City more vulnerable to unionization. And from that group, um, we just literally had to find who's the organic leader. And then out of that group, you know, they're, they're just, they're doing it themselves. You know, if they join your training, they're, you know, they don't need us anymore. But it's like, now we got to the point their campaign is getting a little escalated in a way. Um, I'm not sure how many they're organized. I find out this Friday. Um, what would we do as an organizer right now? Because I'm not, I'm not working as architect at right the second. I'm unemployed. I used to be an architect last year before COVID. Um, I'm also a part of Local 79. I sat down with the Mason tenders. I told them about uh, Local 79, about the architects unionizing, that I need their help. So my task right now is to find another union to like help us out or something. And I, I started calling Kickstarter Union and everything. 
it's getting really escalated and it's exciting. It's just that I, I just don't, I don't know what, I mean, going back to my questions, like, I don't know what exactly the people that did all this, like myself, that are outside of architecture right now, aren't with those offices. What, what, what are we can do to be a uh, help and, and also like push this even further, like, you know, and I've, I've also looked into union busting tactics. So I'm trying to see if any of that shows up to warn uh, the, the people that are organizing as well. But, you know, any, any, any help right now would be tremendously useful for us. Uh, thank you. And now I'm calling on myself on staff. Um, so this has to do with climate change and, um, and just, just the immediate crisis we now face as, um, as a species. Um, I, I just wonder if you, when you look at like the threats to the environment and, and the actions that are being taken, if, if like something stands out to like, well, you know, that we should obviously be doing this or, you know, I, um, I'm, I'm involved with DSA's international committee and um, as part of that, I'm part of the international eco-socialism subcommittee um, and, and we're just getting started and I'm just thinking about strategies right now. And I, I wondered if you had any suggestions or just broadly any thoughts on it you'd recommend. Yeah. Yes, um, definitely. So I think, uh, let me start with COVID first um, and go back to Brand's question. Um, I think at least two things are really important uh, in terms of just the organizing work. Many things important, but two things that relate to organizing um, in the COVID moment. The first is don't change any of the methods essentially, like all the methods that I outlined to you are methods that you can use um, under COVID. And uh, that's one, and I'll, and I'll talk through a little more example of it. And then two, it's really urgent. Like for every worker, like there's essentially, from my view, there's two groups of workers that we're looking at in the pandemic, right? Essential workers, as raised by Jeremy early on, uh, who actually go to work every day and may go to work even more than they were going to work. Uh, in crap conditions, getting sick, not getting sick, crappy wages, whatever it is. But like, so there's two large groups of workers. One is a group of workers who are deemed essential and who are going in all the time um, and who are, <clears throat> who don't have a level of organization that is needed. The second are workers more like academic workers, for example, um, or K through 12 teachers, if there's a union that's fighting and strong with the strategy. I put that if in there since I'm talking to New York right now. Um, and, um, and there are two different ways to approach it. So if you're going to work, like every healthcare worker I know, right, they're at work. Um, and, uh, oh, I was thinking where, who walked off the job this morning? It was in Alberta, actually, a bunch of the biggest hospital in Edmonton. The workers actually walked off the job this morning. Um, but that was Canada. But anyway, um, and we're seeing it happening. Like workers are starting to decide to take action even if they're healthcare workers, which is dicey in a pandemic, right? Because the hospitals are full, but not full. It's very complicated. Some people aren't getting their procedures, some are. So um, for the workers who are not going into their traditional workplace, I'm gonna go, just go back to the example of UCLA that you posited, which could be similar to a K through 12 um, teacher or any number of other workers like that. Um, for, in my view, nothing changes. Whatever your department in, uh, in UCLA, uh, you should be being sure that your department um, is totally well organized and mobilized. Um, have you the one-to-one, -one, you do it on the phone or you do it on Skype, uh, hopefully not Zoom or whatever, but like we sh we're shifting to a lot of phone work and we're shifting to a lot of these kind of meetings, right? Quickly scaling people up and, and getting the technology moving. Um, $15 account on little evil, you know, Zoom, um, but using it um, right now to hold a departmental meeting. Um, to decide to drop a petition um, into a departmental meeting. Um, I, I've been teach. I'm not like, like I said, I just scrambled up to do this, but like I, I like hold up wall charts at, like on my camera when I'm doing wall chart work right now, right? I might put a spreadsheet up 
um, in a screen share that's a photocopy or a scan down version, what we call a hand chart of a wall chart, and actually have the same conversation with a bunch of workers on the phone. So who's the worker that everyone turns to in your department um, when they're not sure how to do something that the department chair, you know, asked them to do or whatever the question is, um, or what the, or that the professor asked them to do, or that the, someone asked, someone with power over them asked them to do. So I don't, I don't, I think COVID challenges it mostly because people, all of us, everyone I know is exhausted. Right by now, people are just exhausted, um, and there is a lot of exhaustion setting in. And I will say that I've been scaling back, like expectations of getting to 90% on petitions in the K through 12 system right now, for example, to like, okay, let's just get majority, right, from supermajority to like majority right now, because we should be real that people are sick of Zoom and tired, and sick and tired of being sick and tired, especially right now. But all the sorts, the same fundamentals. If you're building a site-based structure. Just shift it to phone work and shift it to online work. You can still do a hand signed petition. You can say to every worker, um, take a picture and like while you're talking to them, like, can I take your picture right now? Or can you take a screenshot and send it to me? And don't hang up until you get the screenshot. Like I've been coaching people, right? Like you don't say, send me a screenshot for your face for the petition later. No, no, it's in the middle of the call. That's what an organizer does. Oh, great. Oh, I see it coming on my phone right now. That's super. And then you can make a plan for what that worker is going to do, you know, coming out of that discussion. So to me, the, the you know, half, half, six months in, seven months into the crisis, um, the methods don't change. How we're applying them, like the tools by which we're applying them, that's tactically a little bit different, but the methods are the same. And I think it's really urgent to keep organizing through this pandemic, desperately so. What are the union investors doing? Surveillance. So one big problem with all the technology use is that the union buses are using a lot of surveillance. Um, so whether you're gonna to take to signal, whether you're gonna to take to like whatever the method is, um, even Skype, frankly, like if you were doing a one-on-one, -on -one, an old fashioned phone call is good. Um, if I'm gonna do a one-to-one -one with someone, I'd prefer to jump on Skype if I have to jump on Skype with them versus even Zoom, just level of surveillance is different. One's encrypted, one isn't. Um, but I think that they're doing a hell of a lot of surveillance and we know that they're doing that. Um, right now. So going old school and thinking about like for those of us who are old school, <laughs> who are old, I mean, not old school, like I'm, I'm even, even getting ready to like take to the streets against what may be happening on the 3rd of November. I'm trying to go back and rely on how did we take the Bay Bridge in California and shut it down in 1991 during the anti-war mobilizations before any of us had cell phones or the internet? Because actually we shut down the, the bridge without the internet, without a cell phone. And we did it by having 12 person affinity groups that we built. And 20,000 people showed up to a march in cells of 12, right? DSA can do this in Brooklyn and North Brooklyn right now by neighborhood. So how did we do it in the old days? You know, one of one person out of 12 in the affinity group, you know, at the action would show up to the, you know, to the self-selected person from each affinity group to show up and find out their assignment at the action. No one knew what it was because we were working against um, until it, you know, we were working against the CIA and people who were trying to spy on the movement back then. So just be aware that the union buses are doing super serious um, surveillance now. So the best work for us is still doing work that's not traceable or not trackable um, to the degree that we can do it. And I think we can. Um, in terms of the architect's work, boy, that's where the, I mean, so some of the same stuff I've been talking about, I think applies to the architects, but that's where if they're starting to run into resistance or a harder point in the campaign, that's where it's gonna be important for you to hook them up with someone who actually has a lot of experience dealing with how do you deal with the high risk moment in the campaign. Um, and for, for, for my, from my experience, the value of what we call those public structure tests and doing a lot of them, um, is what helps us sharpen do we have the real informal leader and if we do that informal leader if they're on board with the campaign they're running in an architectural firm is going to be able to carry people through their fear to the end of the campaign but they're probably going to need some coaching at this point right so figuring out whether it's i don't know local 79 i don't know if they have experienced organizers um, certainly the folks who are involved in the UE and the Essential Workers Organizing Committee have some real experience. So I think it's about getting people going in the right direction, but being sure that there's someone who can have a coaching call with you uh, when the shit starts to fly in a hard to win campaign. Um, and that's where experience comes in. 
And that's where my cynicism about people who are critical of people with experience comes in, right? Because it's, it's super important to like know, I call it the four phases of the boss fight. There's like four things the boss does in every single campaign. How do we know? One, we've gone up against them before. Two, they have manuals for it, right? So I spent a lot of time stealing and reading Union Busters manuals and guess what they're doing? They're figuring out who the organic leader idea is and then they're gonna try and go recruit them. Same as our side. So um, the folks who are getting to a position in the architectural campaign need to find an experienced organizer. And between all of you, the 56 of you on the call, I think someone's got to have a lead into someone who can spend a little bit of time with them because that's what's going to be urgent um, is coaching people, right? It's like really one-to-one -one effective coaching on here's what the boss is going to do at this stage. Here's how you stay one step ahead of them at this stage, right? Because staying ahead of the union busters um, is part of what experience teaches us. Um, and that's actually how we win is staying ahead of them. And then lastly, and I think we're probably at the last, at the end, um, lastly, I think um, the question of the climate justice movement. I mean, I what I have wanted for the climate justice movement um, since it changed names from when I was young and I was building the environmental justice movement uh, 20, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30 years ago, I first started working as an organizer in the environmental justice movement before I sort of shifted back into trade union stuff was, um, I want desperately for the climate justice movement to have a theory of power. Um, and the theory of power, the way I understand it, is about structure-based organizing and understanding the relationship between structure-based organizing and then movement moments and single issue campaign work. So, you know, if I was going to give an example of how to move the, the, the you know, the, the electrical brothers who control PG&E, which is dealing, the local that deals with the crisis I'm sitting in in California with the power shutdown. Um, I've said to many people, like, if I were trying to move a local that was a strategic local inside of a strategic industry, I'd be mapping, I'd be systematically charting and mapping every relationship of every decision maker in that local union. And I'd figure out who their kids were, and I'd go have a conversation with the youngest person in their family about climate justice, and I'd figure out how to get them how to go, in the case of the IBW in California, how to go move their old man, because it's a bunch of men mostly. There's a pink color division, and they're delightful. But the line workers are like, you know, several hundred men who climb poles in the middle of electrical storms, they should get a lot of money. But, they're, but they also, but literally, I would be strategically assessing every power structure, if I'm a climate activist, that I need in local campaigns to win and then figuring out how to chart the relationships to move the people who need to move to get out of the way and allow something like a Green New Deal prospect to happen. So the short an the sort of short answer is I've been politely begging, you know, uh, and trying to prod the climate justice movement to take a structure-based approach to the work um, because we have the commitment already, right? We have the commitment to the idea of what needs to happen to save the planet and all the species on it, right? Not just one. Um, but in order to do it, we have to have some of the skill and a theory of power. Um, and workers walking off the job is one theory of power that I subscribe to in a pretty big way. Um, and imagine if the local in California said, we're just going to create a new deal. We're just going to create a green new deal now and bury all these lines and go hire 500 more people to bury all the power lines in California. So that we don't have to worry about them sparking above ground and setting off a fire. Like, there's a logic to it. The question is, how do we build the power? And I'm going to want to know in every campaign I do as an organizer, tenant union, political organizing, trade union organizing, how do I know I'm going to win? How do I know that the people are moving? How do I know our political education is good enough that everyone is actually shifting their position and understanding the imperative for how to win? And that's what structure-based organizing allows us to do. And I think that's probably time, time. So that's what I would wish for the climate justice movement. Okay, thank you so much, and, and forgive me, I, I'm, I'm really not speciesist. Um, I, I do care about <laughs> species beyond, <laughs> beyond our own. Um, you know, Jane, we'd like to, you to stick around for just uh, three more questions or four more questions. There's four more people on stack. Are you up for it? Um, I have to be off in uh, five minutes, Max. So I, I can try and answer shortly, although the thing is you ask complicated questions, and then I try and give complicated answers. So about five more minutes, and then I got a bell. Okay, um, we've got Obi, Kate, Sarah, and Lee. Um, why don't we start with Obi? 
Hi, um, thank you for doing the talk. Um, I was curious about the line you had in your presentation. The um, neoliberalism creates this, it forces this individualism on us. And I'm just wondering, is that the biggest obstacle these days in getting people to join a union? I know I would probably be like, I'm okay myself. Or is it just merely the fear of losing the job? What has been the biggest obstacle in talking to people? Okay, thanks. Um, Kate? Sure, thanks. Um, I was wondering, um, and a lot of this is probably applicable to the situation, but when the fight is with your own union, um, in New York, we saw the UFT make concession after concession after concession for the um, opening of unsafe schools and was a little too friendly with de Blasio. How do you fight your own union? Um, thanks. Uh, that's probably all you can do in three minutes. Okay. Or should we try for one more, Jane? Your call. You can. Yeah, you can try for one more. Okay, Sarah. Or Sayara, however you pronounce it. Yeah, uh, thank you so much. Um, I was wondering if you think there's, a, I mean, it's uh, somehow the same as the last question, if you think there's a difference between like rigidified, uh, bureaucratized unions and what you're um, suggesting for unionizing. Yeah, so let me just start on that, that last, the, the last two going backwards. Um, Kate and S Saraya said it? Saira. Saira, Saira. Um, I think that he, both of your questions um, go to the core of organizing that I'm describing. I mean, um, I think I say in a, there's an interview now on Jackman that I think in these times just ran uh, where I talk about this. And I say that when people say to me, well, how do you take, you know, what do you do about a bad union? Um, that's like the story of my life is what do you do about a bad union? <laughs> Target rich environment, you know what I mean? So what do you have to do? You have to like figure out how to identify the workers who are going to move the majority of the workers you have to do you have to build a site dsa should be building a site-based structure with the uft caucus right with more like school by school by school my impression from a distance from a distance is that it's been a self-selecting approach and not a structure-based approach and the, the doing the methodical work of figuring out who's that key teacher or two in each school school by school across every borough like pick a suburb pick north brooklyn then pick brooklyn then pick like and build it out and do the really hard work of well how do you know let's start a petition in my school well let's do a school-based petition well can we get to where like are we do we have the power to get to mulgrew whoever it is right now and say um look we have, a, we have a petition with 75% of every one of the teachers in New York City demanding that schools don't open is really different than a small minority of people, even if it's a big majority, I mean, if it's a big minority, unless you've got the site-based structure developed and built to force the union to the position that the workers want, it's gonna be hard to do it. The specific problem with UFT, as I understand it, is the issue of <clears throat> retirees voting, so that's one thing in terms of how do you win the election. It's like a very specific issue that's sort of unique to the UFT of New York. And that's, you know, I know I can answer that question now, but, but it starts by the same exact skill set we're describing. Can you get a majority of your coworkers to agree with you school by school by school across the city of New York and build a borough-based structure and a sub-borough-based structure to then work yourself up to having a supermajority? Because it's going to be a hell of a lot harder for the union leadership to do something that's against the interest when actually a majority when a majority of workers are ready to go so it's hard work but it's no different than the work that they had to do in chicago or in los angeles to take control of their unions um, it was structure test structure test structure test organizing from below identifying a site-based leader at each school um, and building that structure painfully and slowly over many years um, and it's hard work i'm all organizing is hard work. So that's for two of you. Um, and then to um, OB, I think it's, um, I think that the individualism is, um, is in fact um, a product of a conscious political project to make people not think collectively, to not build solidarity. And the, and the end product of it is a lot of this individualism. Why workers, though, don't form unions as easily is definitely fear, no question. It's fear. It's really hard uh, in a lot of this country when the boss says, I'm going to fire you if you put that union button on. 
it's hard to overcome that unless you've built the organizational structure and capacity to be able to overcome it. Um, so, you know, the fear campaigns are real. Um, and part of why I walked you through the structure test and those wall charts was just to show um, the slow methodical development of how we get one structure test, another structure test. Each of those structure tests are real. They're about something that the people really care about. And they're really simple petitions like, I want more PPE now. Like that's like, a, that's like the how long most petitions I do are. They're two or three sentences long. And then we start to move it out in a workplace to figure out can we get majority support and what's gonna take to get majority support. And each one of the structure tests builds solidarity. And constructing solidarity is an essential thing we have to do um, in the moment that we're in in this country where there are people every day trying to deconstruct solidarity. So that's part of why I love structure tests too, is that every single structure test is an excuse to talk to your coworkers and build more solidarity among and between the ranks. Um, Jane, you're wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, it's been such a pleasure having you and, um, and uh, we will take your words to heart. Um, we're gonna move on to announcements and, and maybe uh, Jeremy would like to bid you adieu as well. Uh, sure. Jeremy? Um, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Jane, again so much. Um, I think if DSA, you know, uh, Amy Comey Barrett was in fact confirmed. And so DSA and all of us have a lot to do. A lot of work uh, to do. In times to come. And hopefully this helps us in the work and build, build power um, to win. Um, so a few announcements uh, on note. Is, Take care, everybody. Go get them. Thank you, Jane. Yeah. <laughs> right, thank, you. Bye, Jane. Uh, thank you. Bye. So, thank you. Uh, just quickly for our brand announcements. Um, we have our membership drive, as everybody may have heard. We're trying to get to 100K members. Um, we're going to drop a link in the chat. If you are not a member currently, please join. You should all find the member pledge that says you are going to recruit three people. I recruited my sister um, and uh, I'll think of people in your life who can do this sort of work, who have these sort of ideas or can be moved to have these ideas and bring them aboard. Um, secondly, if you are a union member or workplace, you'd like to organize it, or if you just want to build your skills as an organizer, uh, please contact our labor branch. You might not know, DSA has a labor branch, um, which does this sort of work um, all the time. Uh, as socialists, we're all committed to the labor movement, but they're really committed. Um, so please email them at labor at socialist.nyc if you want to get involved. Uh, two weeks, we have our next night school, Monday, November 9th, presuming um, our, you know, we're all in one piece after this uh, goddamn election next week. Um, then uh, we'll have another night school, this one on race and class um, and on the history of race in America. Uh, please don't miss it. Um, it has our own member, Justin Charles, leading the session and will be an in-depth analysis um, of the key events that birthed the system in this country and what socialist thinking is as to how we eliminate it uh, in a future society. Um, Action Ask, uh, this Saturday we're tabling at early sites to people to DSA, um, show up in gear, show up in your DSA gear and people you in our yeah Bernie he was great I would I voted for him in the primary but you never have to vote for him. and you'll be like do I have an organization for you? so come out to Maria Hernandez um, and uh, you can vote yourself and if you have voted please uh, come help us out with that finally we have a branch meeting um, this Wednesday North Brooklyn branch we're gonna be discussing among other things what uh, we do if uh, Biden wins, what we do if Trump wins, and uh, as well as city council races and North Brooklyn um, and New York City DS general, uh, how the city councils are shaping up. Um, only finally, we're having a Halloween uh, uh, outdoor social um, this coming Sunday, a post. November 1st. Um, so it's at Cooper, Cooper Park. Uh, thank you everybody for coming. The solidarity forever. We, the struggle continues. We're going to win. 
We gotta win. Oh, it's Hernandez for the social. Thank you, Ryan. <laughs>